folks, and welcome to Typology, the show in which we explore the mystery of the human personality through the lens of the Enneagram. I'm Anthony Skinner, producer of the show, and we are back with part two of our two-part series with Kirsten Powers. Kirsten is an American author, columnist, and political analyst. She currently writes for USA Today. She's an on-air political analyst at CNN, where she appears regularly on Anderson Cooper 360, CNN Tonight with Don Lemon, and The Lead with Jake Tapper. Prior to CNN, Powers worked at Fox News as a political analyst and contributor, where she appeared regularly across the channel, including Special Report with Brett Baer, Fox News Sunday, The Kelly File, and The O'Reilly Factor. Powers previously was a columnist for the New York Post and later the Daily Beast, which she left to join USA Today. The list goes on and on, and you are in for a treat today. Hey, before I turn it over to Ian, I want to give a shout out to some of our Patreon supporters. Logan Jansen, Nathaniel Evans, Ariel Castillo, Emily May Curtin, Michael McDonald, Marilyn Johnson, Laurie Scarpelli, Karen Besant, Rebecca Conroe, Claire Williams, Rachel Hagstrom, John Carl Lewis, Kathy Morgan, Carrie Brewster, and Michelle Cooper. Hey, thank each and every one of you. We couldn't do the show without you. Make sure you go to www.patreon.com forward slash typology. That's www.patreon.com forward slash T-Y-P-O-L-O-G-Y. Again, we thank each and every one of you for your support, and we so, so appreciate it. All right, now let's join Ian in progress with his interview with Kirsten Powers in part two of our two-part series. And now, here is the host of our show, Ian Cron. This is so great for people like... So let's let's go to the unconscious motivations. Do yeah. do you have a compulsive need to perfect yourself, others, and the world, perhaps the environment, and perhaps you know you you feel this sense that making a mistake is like the worst thing in the world. Like making mistakes is n- almost an intolerable experience, right? Which is why your reaction may be, "I have to be right." I, I mean, I have to be right, right? Or is your unconscious motivation more like this a compulsive need to assert control and strength over the environment and others in service to hiding or masking vulnerability and weakness both from yourself and others which of those I think two it's the second one okay yeah. yeah okay so you know you gotta look at the unconscious motivation if 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 yeah. that sticks know, that's the, eight. That's the yeah. key yeah no i'm actually pretty and this is another thing like my fiance has remarked on is that he's like you're so you're not really that hard on yourself you know what i mean like in a way he's actually pretty hard on himself when it comes to things like like so i'm hard on myself if i uh say something and people react and i'm like oh i could have said that better you know, and now everybody thinks I think something I don't think. And I will kind of go into a shame spiral over that. Um, I'm not hard on myself if there's a typo in a column or I spelled somebody's name wrong or whatever. Like I just am like, whatever that happens. Or, you know, I just screw up on something or I forget. I'm just not like that kind of stuff. I'm super like let go. I have a ton of grace for myself. Um, But then there are other things, like I said, that can really send me into a major shame spiral. Right. So, yeah, I mean, I never tell people their type, uh, yeah. but I always say, well, you know, if I were you, I would look closely, uh, do a little bit more research on that eight thing. And, mm-hmm. and and also, you know, the going down the funnel, if you want to find the finer distinctions, you know, you start looking at subtypes if you have some confusion, yeah. because chances are you may be a, a counter type. And there is, as you know, uh, the counter type of the eight. So. That is the social eight. And yeah, when I read that, I definitely connected with a lot of that. Right. So these are people um, who are highly protective and loyal. Pro- mm-hmm. Protective being the op- you know the really operative word in that sentence. Yeah. 
And they express lust and aggression, right? Lust being their their uh, deadly sin or passion mm-hmm. in the service of life and other people, you know? Yeah. And so uh, oftentimes, for example, we had a woman on the show named Melissa Green, and she said, when I told people I was an eight, they didn't believe me. She said, because they said, you're so nurturing and caring in a way, you know what I mean? But it's like- Well, it's so funny that you brought up her name because um, Claire Diaz Ortiz, who you had on- yeah the podcast as well we were texting about this because i was saying oh my gosh he thinks i'm an eight I, oh my god how could he think that and you know and she said it's so funny that you can't see that mm. <laughs> and, and she said you know you remind me of melissa green and she i didn't know melissa green and so she she sends me this thing of melissa like a you know a bio and i was like gosh she sounds amazing you know but i was like but that's not me and she's like no but it is <laughs> yeah i mean so. yeah so these data points you know are really important because you know human beings are not transparent to themselves and so we do have to rely on others to help us on the journey toward identifying our type i mean you're the only one who can yeah but as a data point people who love you and care about you and have insight uh can really see things about us that you know like so one of the questions i encourage people to ask all the time is if they have the nerve which is of another person a friend uh is uh what do you know about me that I don't know about me huh. that I should? <laughs> oh, interesting. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, you know, yeah. that's what she did is, is, is help you maybe see something that wasn't, is a blind spot. Yeah. And when she sort of explained why, I was like, oh, yeah, I do do a lot of those things. Like, I'm the person in the group when somebody says something horrible and nobody says anything, I'm the one who speaks up, mm. you know, even though I don't want to. Um, but I think, you know, the thing is, is that I do think so much of my resistance. So I think when I thought I was a one, I didn't like it. I was sort of like, eh, that's kind of, they sound kind of like Eeyore or something. Right. You know what I mean? Like I was like, I don't really want to be a one, but I didn't love it, but I didn't, I, I think I thought I hated it until you said eight. And then I was like, I do not want to be an eight. Like that is just every, I've spent my whole life trying to not be that person. Why? Um, because, well, because like you had asked me, has anyone ever said to you, you're too much. And it's like, that could be on my gravestone. You know, (laughs) it's just literally like all I ever heard my entire life. was like, you're just too much. You're just so much. Why are you so emotional? Why do you feel things so deeply? Why do you have so many opinions? Why do you, you know? And so it was like, I, I think at some point I decided I don't want to be too much anymore. Mm. And um, I think, and I stuffed it and it still would come out, right? Because in my professional life, but in my personal life, I think I got smaller and smaller and smaller until I got really sick, Mm. you know, and I got really sick. I got chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia and I was just, um, and I, and I, I feel like I've gotten healthier as I've started to kind of step back into my power a little bit. Um, but it just really was, I mean, in our culture, particularly when I was growing up, it's getting better now. Um, you know, people hate powerful women. Mm -hmm. (laughs) They just do. Mm. And, and they're always looking for, you know, they're always judging you. They're always like, why can't you be more, you know, like other women and women are judging you and everybody doesn't like you. Right. It's a, you know, some people like you, but the bulk of people don't like you. And I wanted to be liked. So. It's interesting. I would say that uh, many Enneagram teachers say this, that when they're healthy, eights could be the most popular number on the Enneagram uh, yeah. by far because they're funny. They're, they, they're like mm-hmm. Zorba the Greek. That's to me the icon. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like just full of lust and gusto yeah. and, you know, this like they just can't get enough of life, you know. Right. Um, all right. Now I'm going to come back in just a second. What I want to talk about is this incredible place called Restoring the Soul. It's this amazing intensive counseling experience that people can go into when the weekly 50 minute hour is not enough to put out uh, uh, the blazing fire, whatever it may be, you know? And so my friend, Michael Cusick, he's been doing this for 20 years, does these two week intensives or one week intensives. They're half day blocks in Denver, Colorado. And, um, you know, what it is, it's deep work. You're doing deep work for people who can't wait for a year or two years of 50-minute sessions to have effect. They, they really need it pretty much quicker. And it's a great jump start before you go back home and, you know, move into... Like, you'll do a year or two of work in two weeks, you know? So, 
Uh, I want to just, as I said, the only word I can use is commend the the work that uh, these folks do. And if you want to know how you can get in touch with Michael on Restoring the Soul, 303-932-9777. 303-932-9777. Call about a consultation uh, with, with uh, Michael Cusick. And, um, or you can go to restoringthesoul.com. Com. And for typology listeners, you can go to restoringthesoul.com forward slash typology and you get this great PDF about relationships and uh, the effect that trauma has on them. So, all right. So, so Kirsten, let's talk about your personal life just for a second, because yeah. uh, that might give us some clues, too. So a social two is a little bit calmer and softer than the other the social two. social eight, you mean? Yeah, the social yeah. you know the sort of the social subtype of eight yeah. they're just there's a little bit more softness and warmth to them mm-hmm. uh but like a blind spot for them is recognizing when their own need for love and protection are cons- like they they don't see that in themselves as much as they do that need in others for love and protection so what how does that ring for you Oh yeah, that's totally true. I mean, I think I'm now in a place. I'm in a. I'm in the healthiest place in my life right now, so I think I'm becoming aware of these things. But I, I, you know, I was kind of aware of it when I was younger, but I didn't know how to articulate it. It was, you know, I just always felt like, why do people think I don't need them, or why do people think I'm so strong, or why are people always saying that to me? Because I'm actually not. I actually am a super emotional, tender person, but everybody just thinks I'm so tough. Yeah. Why do you think that, I just want to ask you a question on this, like why, yeah. why do you think women are as hard on women eights as men are? You would think that women would be like, oh man, we need more, but, but they're not. Why do you think that is? Uh, because they've internalized it the same way everybody else has. Mm-hmm. So it's like you grow up under a system and you don't even realize that you're, you know, what you're doing. I mean, my mother's a feminist. My mother's a trailblazing feminist who moved to Alaska and became an archaeologist and was, you know, way ahead of her time and stood up to the patriarchy and became a dean, the first woman dean at the University of Alaska. She still was trying to, like, telling me, like, stop being so big. Wow. Yeah. It's like you just, because it's just still, you have to, I think we are just moving into a space now where you know, you have at least some people saying like, no women, like be big, Yeah. you know, yep. but it's a new phenomenon. Yeah. So, you know, I think that, um, this is an example of where when you're younger, you know, and you don't have the ability yet to monitor and observe the effect that your personality is having on other people and, mm-hmm. and you don't know how to regulate it and you don't even, right. you don't even know you have to regulate it, but you know, as you get older, you know, life will not cooperate with that, you know, kind of self-presentation where the personality just is like a puppy off the leash. You know, it, yeah. you know, uh, you know, so but so what I want to do right now is I want to read you a couple sentences from my friend Beatrice Chestnut's book on yeah. the social eight. Uh, OK, because I think we, we may have just honed in on some. She writes yeah. the social eight subtype is the most intellectual of the three Mm -hmm. sounds like you yeah uh but these eights also rebel against the dominant patriarchal culture this rebellion necessarily involves a mixture of authority and intellect because the dominant authority in patriarchal societies tends to promote the intellectual control of impulses and excess Mm -hmm. now that's this that's I don't know. You just used the word patriarchy that before I yeah. even got to that yeah. that paragraph. Does that? Yeah. I don't know. Do you do you ring with that? Totally. And I sent that to a couple of my friends, and they were like, "Oh my gosh, this is you to a T." Um, okay, that's But I have good. to say, during the period that I got sick, though, um, I had become uh, I had become a Christian. I'd had a very like s- profound spiritual experience. I was attending an evangelical church. And I kind of fell into the evangelical world. I never really considered myself an evangelical, which I think probably is sort of an eight thing. Like I never was totally on board with it, but I was like, but I also had been, it was right after some serious trauma. My father had died suddenly of a heart attack at age 61. I mean, like, boom, dead. My grandmother, who was the closest person to me, died the year after. Then my stepfather got liver cancer and he died. So it came on the heels of a lot of this. 
And so I think it was a little bit of a trauma response. And I really suppressed that, right? right? Because evangelicalism is is patriarchal. I mean, it just is. You Whoa. Know, for the most yes. part. Yes. You know, um, and so there, you know, there are some some evangelical churches that have women pastors, but they're not. That's not the norm. So I, I think I suppressed that, you know, in me, and I think I'm coming back around to it and really like saying, no, I, I don't like. I'm done with the patriarchy. Right. Um, and I know that makes people really uncomfortable. Right. But that's okay. Whereas yeah. I think before I was kind of, and I was reacting also to having what I just described, like the feminist trailblazing mother who, um, you know, I grew up in Fairbanks, Alaska in the 70s and 80s, uh, and nobody was a feminist. And I, my mom was the only w mother with a career. I mean, there were all these things, and all I wanted was like, why can't we just be normal? Hmm. Why can't we just be like other people, right? Right. And so I think that I, a lot of the things I've done have been a reaction. And that's what's, I think, been so hard for me in the last couple of days of realizing of how much of my life has been a reaction to trauma. Mm -hmm. You know, right? we're, we're going to do a show on this. Um, and I, I have a couple of people uh, who have come into my life recently because of some family issues, which I hope in a year from now we'll be able to discuss. Uh, yeah. But you know, the recent research on attachment disorders and mm -hmm. on uh, the effect of trauma on our lives. And, you know, I, and I want to explore more and more about the effect of trauma on personality development. And oh, you know, I want to write a book about that. So we should definitely. Talk. All right. Well, I, let's yeah, let's talk yeah, about it. I'm always looking for I think I'm always looking for someone to carry half the load. <laughs> <laughs> no, because it's really amazing when I think about it that just, and I think when I was thinking I was a one, I was like, well, you know, I became a Christian and I did everything by the rules and I was trying to like be a good Christian. But the truth is that was the biggest rebellion of my life because to my family, going to an evangelical church was like the worst thing I could have ever done to them. And to my tribe, which was people from democratic politics, they were like, what are you doing? Right. 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 So everything I was doing, I thought I was doing for totally pure reasons. But I just think so much of it was just a response to trauma. And, 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 and the sort of, it, I think this is an eight thing, the all or nothing thing, right? Yes. Like it wasn't like, oh, I became a believer and I can be like a, you know, an Episcopalian or something. You know what I mean? It was like, no, I got to be like all in with, you know what I mean? Like go into this like complete extreme thing that I wasn't even really comfortable with, but it was like I couldn't find the grays and it wasn't really until i discovered richard Rohr where i was like oh oh my gosh so i can do this without being like extreme yeah and i i want to say that um you know that your the black and white thinking you just expressed perhaps extends uh into something which is you said you know uh, I'm realizing, you know, how much of my life has been about reaction and trauma and the way I am. And it sounded a little black and white, too, the way you just expressed it, which is like, well, it's a both and, you know, like, yeah. like huh. maybe you're called to be a prophet in that world as a yeah. as a woman uh, eight, perhaps, yeah. who isn't uh, going to, you know, give truck to women being you know placed in positions of secondary importance or authority right. and etc so i would just say there, there may be both a prophetic call and the prophetic call may be born of a particular wound which right. can be leveraged for the good you know huh. and so maybe it's yeah. a, a little bit of a both and all right so yeah. here's where i want to end i want to talk about okay. i want to talk about your about wings for a second okay yeah this is another finer set of distinctions for people right so mm -hmm. let me describe these two different eights okay yeah so one uh is the eight with a seven wing this is a pretty reckless number okay y you yeah. know it's it's a big risk-taking number and eights are already big risk takers big decision makers you know yeah um, and more than a one it would ever be. A one, a one would be more deliberate and planful and, and, and sometimes would procrastinate a big decision for fear of making a mistake. Mm. And not an eight. <clears throat> an eight would be yeah. like, big decision time. Let's go do it, you know? Yeah. Um, so the eight, seven would just be a more forceful personality. Uh, a, you know, a, yeah, they'd be opinionated. Uh, like I just said, big risk takers, uh, impulsive, they're more sociable and talkative, uh, confident, 
Uh, and they have more probably of an addictive personality than an eight with a nine. Okay, let's talk about eight with a nine. Okay, now these these are very these are not very different, but they're different from the eight with, with obviously with a seven. So mm. you, if you were an eight with a nine, uh, your leadership style is is more grounded in a in a way to assert control, right? Mm. Uh, and you're more thoughtful and, and methodical. Right. So mm-hmm. I'm hearing you when you're talking about how you are on, on like O'Reilly and it's like Bill O'Reilly. It's yeah. like, no, you're thoughtful and, and you are methodical in, mm-hmm. in your thinking, which, by the way, in that setting, I have to say when I've watched you, because I've watched a couple of YouTube clips this week, mm-hmm. it's like your logical, methodical way is a little bit of flipping the bird at somebody who's out of control. <laughs> oh, no. What do you mean? Well, it's like, who's the adult in the room? you're uh-huh. you're the adult in the room you're yeah. like hmm. you know uh you're acting like a crybaby ranting <laughs> nut person mm. and uh <laughs> and i'm just going to be the adult in the room and that's a way of asserting strength and control over the environment and others too hmm. i bet you he hmm. had plenty of moments or, or people you've been on shows with where it's like they can't make you flip hmm. it's almost it's impossible right that's a yeah. So anyway, that's a thought that I had. Um, yeah. Very protective of inner circle. Uh, mm-hmm. They so this is it. I'm reading this from something. They may dominate in a cool, collected way. Yeah, that's me. You know. Uh, not, yeah, I, I I relate to everything you said about the nine. Yeah. That eight with a nine wing. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, yeah, yeah. And that I think that when I can't. Um, you know, I'm not confrontational in my personal life. Mm-hmm. Uh, I often like sit on things for a long time. I'm not the just go have the conversation and have it out kind of person because peace is really important to me in my yeah. personal life. Yeah. And that's also maturity. You yeah. Know? And I wasn't like that when I was young. No, when I was young, I was a disruptor. I was just, I disru- you know, yeah. Yeah. I was always arguing with people. Yeah. I just, but now I'm like, oh, I just want peace. It's just so much more important to me. Yeah. Um, and I think maybe it's the moving towards the two also, mm-hmm. where I just am more interested in helping other people. I don't want to, you know, only if it's really critical, you know, like you have to have the conversation. But for the most part, I'm like, I just want to help my friends. I don't want to be like a yeah. problem for them. Yeah. Well, I have to say, I think this podcast is going to be helpful for a lot of people because, as I said, you know, people like ones and eights often get confused, uh, and you know, they're both in that anger triad. They handle, but they mm-hmm. and so they handle it very differently. But here's the question I want to close on: Based on our conversation now, are you less repulsed by the idea that you might be an eight, or are you more uncomfortable? I'm less repulsed, but I still don't like it. So that also is a telltale sign that you may be an eight. Yeah, I still just am like. Yeah. So whenever, I yeah. I don't want to be that person. I, I did not. I did not want to be a. I did not want to be a four. Uh, and I meet a lot of numbers that don't want to be the number they are. And here's the story I tell them, and and uh, I hope it helps. And it may, okay. it may or, or it may or may not. So in India, in the colonial period, uh, the British wanted to build a golf course. And what they hadn't baked into their calculations were the monkeys. And so every time they hit a ball, the monkeys would run out, they would grab it and run away, right? Mm-hmm. Now that's pretty frustrating. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and so they built walls, they shot them, they relocated oh. them. You know what I mean? Like they did everything to oh. get rid of the monkeys, right? Yeah. And, and eventually, they, they had to write a rule into the course, uh, you know, rule book that said, you got to play the ball where the monkey drops it. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I my gosh. <laughs> and so many times in my life when I have thought about my personality, I have thought to myself, hey, bro, you just got to play the ball where the monkey drops it. <laughs> oh, Kirsten, I am so happy and uh energized and uh wish we had more time we're gonna have you back on maybe we'll have you and jonathan Merritt on the same time oh my gosh that would be so fun how cool would that be that would be so fun and uh i'll tell you what would be good is we can get um you know two more conservative thinkers and you and jonathan and and i'll be the moderator how's that (laughs) 
That would be cool. And then we'll halfway through, I'll stop and we'll do personality analysis and see how it goes. Uh, and anyway, I'm I'm a, I'm so excited uh, about the possibility if if life allows it for us to become friends in a deeper oh, way. Oh yeah, totally. I feel like we're already friends. Yeah, we are, and and because, because we have so many friends in common. We do, and also I think. And I've said this before, I do because my mom and daughter are eights. I have a special affection for uh, women eights. And oh, that's I, so sweet. Yeah, and I, I, I think most of my life I, I have been committed to being an advocate and a champion for their power and presence uh, in the world as being necessary because we can't tell God he made a mistake. Yeah, right. Right? Now, is your daughter comfortable with being an eight? Well, I would say... Yeah, I mean, you know, she's an activist. She's 27. And so I would say that some of the excess that you described as being a young woman has Mm -hmm. softened uh, and gotten a little bit more what I would call uh, blurry in a healthy way. Her edges are less sharp. Uh, She knows when to pull out her guns and when to leave them in the holster a little bit more. And, and she's, a, she's an A with a nine, so like when she writes a letter, it has a more ironic tone. It's a little bit more mm-hmm. like, let's reconcile. And she's very right. deliberate. And she, like she went to Middlebury. She, I'll tell you, man, you do not want to get into a political argument with my, my daughter yeah. because <laughs> it's, not about, it's not about, you know, she has the facts. Yeah. Like she has done the research. And if you don't come with game on in terms of like the data, she will mm-hmm. crush you. If you just come in with a feeling kind of argument, yeah. you know, know, and whatever, it's like, okay. You can just hear the gun go snick, snick when she <laughs> then that happens. So anyway, so again, thanks for being on the show. Typology listeners, um, I want you to go out. I would love it if you went and got uh, Kirsten's book, uh, which uh, I'm going to go do, The Silencing, How the Left is Killing Free Speech. It should be fascinating because of your own more left of center uh, perspective. Uh, how to and you know you can get a hold of, of uh, Kirsten and all the things that she's doing at uh, you go to you could follow her on Instagram at Kirsten Powers or on Twitter at Kirsten Powers. And again, folks, please remember the words of the great Oscar Wilde: "Be yourself. Everybody else is already taken." See ya. <laughs>